So we're ready to get started, and I want you to know that I'm not Jack Estel. He's the one who typically does this job, uh, but he has uh, is recovering at home from surgery, so I'm sure that we all wish him a very, very speedy recovery, especially you who have his class this semester. Um, we are really delighted to have a phenomenal speaker. I'll introduce him more fully in just a minute. I have to do what Jack does, and that's tell you where the bathrooms are. They're outside that door. To remind you to turn off your cell phone. Is anybody doing that? Okay, good. And uh, what else does Jack tell you all the time? Ask questions at the end. Anything else that I'm forgetting? Flames. We have already ordered the pizza and the beer at Flames. And Flames is our gathering where if you're here, uh, you're all welcome to come. We sit around a big corner. There's pizza bites and beer drinks and some sodas that you can continue this discussion with our speaker and with one another and just keep thinking about ideas. That's a, a long tradition that we've had. I hope you join us. I'm going to be there. Our speaker will be there. And uh, I'm sure all my students over there will uh, be at Flames. So please join us. And, and because we want to spend the time at Flames and our speakers got a flight out of San Jose, we might be ending at 6.30 today so we can just maximize our Flames time uh, on that. Uh, that's how important it is to us. So I would invite you now to consider the question, the provocative question, is corporate welfare constitutional? Timothy Sanderfer, our speaker, is the Vice President for Litigation at the Goldwater Institute. Before joining Goldwater, he served for 15 years as litigator at the Pacific Legal Foundation, where he won important victories for economic liberty in California, Kentucky, Missouri, Oregon, and other states, and participated in many significant eminent domain cases, including Kilo versus New London. He is the author of three books, Cornerstone of Liberty, Property Rights in the 21st Century America, um, The Conscience of the Constitution, and The Right to Earn a Living, Economic Freedom and the Law, as well as some 45 scholarly articles on subjects ranging from eminent domain and economic li liberty to antitrust, copyright, evolution and creationism, slavery and the Civil War, and the legal issues in Shakespeare and ancient Greek drama. You can ask him a lot of questions, let me say. He is an adjunct scholar with the Cato Institute, and his articles have appeared in the Cato Supreme Court Review, the Claremont Review of Books, Liberty, National Review, Reason.com, the San Francisco Chronicle, Regulation, the Washington Times, and elsewhere. What I want to say that's off this script is that we've had uh, Tim Sandifer speak before. He speaks with so much passion. Um, it's a very moving talk, no matter what the subject is. But behind all that passion is hours and hours of research and logic and reasoning from principles. And so I really invite you to relax and to enjoy this thought process and to realize that he is willing, ready, and able to answer any question that you want to ask at the end. We'll be going around with microphones, and I challenge you as good economic critical thinkers to ask these probing questions. I invite Tim Sanford to come up and begin. So you can begin in the back. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Boy, hours and hours of research and scholarship makes it sound so boring. Actually, I was asked to, uh, earlier today, I was asked by somebody, uh, how are you so disciplined with the, all your writing? And my answer to that is, I'm not disciplined, I'm obsessed. And uh, there's a big difference between the two. Obsession can look like discipline. But it's very much the opposite. Uh, the difference being that if you're just obsessed with something rather than disciplined, your desk is very messy, right? Uh, you're not. If you're a disciplined person, is very organized and and strategic. When I don't care about something, I just don't do it. So, um, now uh, as for uh, the mention earlier about a uh, about doing uh, a, re a magazine issue on women in leadership, it occurred to me over here that 
that my employers have always been women since I got out of law school. My bosses have always been women, one of whom is with us tonight, uh, my mentor, Debra, Deborah LaFetra, who has joined us from the Pacific Legal Foundation and has promised to join us at Flames afterwards. So if you want to talk about uh, work in the law, in public interest litigation, how to sue the government for a living and get paid for it, you, you're in for a treat. I, I want to talk tonight a, a little bit about economics and a little bit about law and a little bit about politics and, and mix them all together because one of the things that we do at the Goldwater Institute is try and, and approach public policy issues from these, these, all these different perspectives to try to affect change that will maximize liberty and the promise of freedom in people's lives. And in, in coming to talk to you today, I tried to come up with the most economic-oriented presentation I could, but, you know, I'm a lawyer. My undergraduate degree is in economics, but I don't practice economics as a professional matter. So when I talk about these issues, I'll talk about them in, largely in legal and political terms. And let's start with the question, the obvious question, is corporate welfare unconstitutional? Well, the first question is, what is corporate welfare? We talk a lot about it, we complain about it. Political debates are often uh, hinge on the, the concept of cronyism and, and, and uh, corporations using the government for their own welfare. This is a classic def dictionary definition. What do we mean by corporate welfare? Well, it's the, the government support of or subsidy of private business such as by tax incentives. Well, what is that? It means that politicians get to decide who wins in the economy rather than having economic success follow from hard work and satisf satisfying consumers. I think we all remember this classic Calvin and Hobbes strip in which Calvin tries to charge $15 for a glass of lemonade at his lemonade stand, and when Susie refuses to pay, he decides he needs a subsidy. That's what corporate welfare is all about. Why is corporate welfare a bad thing? Anybody? What's, really wa what's wrong with corporate welfare? Okay, anybody else? Generally inefficient, that's a very good one. Economists will very often say it's economically inefficient. It wastes resources on politics instead of satisfying consumers. So if I'm, uh, let's say, Costco, I could spend the capital that I have as the Costco Corporation lowering prices, increasing customer satisfaction, and that sort of thing, or I can spend that money lobbying local governments to steal people's property through eminent domain and give it to me so I can open another store. That's how I can spend my money. Cronyism in corporate welfare tends to be economically wasteful and inefficient because it spends money on things, on other things, right? A good, another good example of this kind of inefficiency would be import tariffs, right? Tariffs are a tax on working class people who want to buy foreign imports from Walmart. And that tax is intended to save American jobs, by which we mean we tax pe working class people at Walmart and take that money essentially, more or less, and give it to powerful corporations so that the, the, um, they can continue to overcharge for lower quality products than the imports. Some time ago, I mean, you all remember the, the late Bush, early Obama uh, GM bailout, right? Some time ago, I was shopping for a car and I chose to buy a Honda. And because I bought a Honda, GM lost a little bit in terms of its market share. And as a result, rather than sell a better product for a lower price, GM went to the government and basically forced me to buy a GM car, right? Took money out of my pocket to give to GM. That's what we mean by the economic inefficiency of corporate welfare. But again, I'm not really wanting to talk primarily about economic inefficiency. I want to talk about questions like justice and constitutional legitimacy. One reason that corporate welfare is bad is because People shouldn't be forced to pay the bills of companies when they don't profit from that, right? I don't benefit from GM getting my tax dollars. I don't get anything in exchange for that. Subsidizing them takes money out of my pocket and hands it to, over to them simply because they exercise political power. I shouldn't be forced to pay the bills from them if I don't benefit. And if I just choose not to participate in it, right? It's my money and I would just rather not. It's my money. Take it, to take it from me and give it to General Motors or any other company requires some kind of justification beyond the fact that the government has just decided to do that to me. 
Also, I think there, one reason why corporate welfare really bothers people is that there's just something intuitively wrong about the idea that it takes wealth away from poorer working class people and tends to give it to wealthier, more politically well-connected people, people who are already pretty well off. So what are the arguments in favor of corporate welfare? Well, typically there are four, right? First, the project wouldn't get built otherwise. In this case, from the Simpsons, the monorail. Anybody remember the monorail episode? Monorail, 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 dope, right? That's Leonard Nimoy there, for those who might not recognize him. The, court, the cosmic ballet continues. Uh, one of them is the monorail wouldn't get built otherwise. Another one is the monorail will have important secondary consequences. Multiplier effects is the, the, the jargon term that a lot of economists like to throw around. It means we're making this up is basically what that means, right? It'll have multiplier effects. Uh, it will improve the aesthetics of the neighborhood, whatever it might be. And if we don't build it, the neighboring town will. And, of course, it'll create jobs. Well... I have never found these arguments to be particularly persuasive, which may not surprise you. If the project won't get built without the subsidy, why not? Maybe because it's economically inefficient. Maybe because people don't really want one. If a project were going to be economically profitable, if it were to gain more in returns than it cost, then presumably some, some entrepreneur would have been out there to gather that capital together to create that thing, right? If, there, if a government is involved in building the project, that's typically prima facie evidence that the project is an economic loss. Otherwise, private business would do it. Government isn't in the business, of presumably, of going out there and building Taco Bells because Taco Bell will take care of that because Taco Bell will gain the rewards of doing so. But government is often in the business of building make-work projects that don't earn a return on the investment. That's why the government has to subsidize it with tax dollars, right? What about the secondary consequences? Well, very often they're not provable. They're not provable at all, and very often the proof isn't given. A lot of the time it's not measurable stuff. It's like, well, it'll improve the, the aesthetics of the neighborhood. It'll make this town livable. It'll make people want to stay in our town, that sort of thing. Hard to measure and very often unmeasurable. And often the negative consequences are not measurable either or are not measured. What are the consequences of building this project? Is it going, are there going to be negative consequences? There's all sorts of incentives to downplay the negative consequences of this project. If Springfield doesn't build the monorail, Shelbyville will, right? The answer is good, let them, right? It's a waste of money. If they want to throw their money away on some boondoggle project, let them, right? What about the, the, uh, the fact that consumers, again, will, the consumers will pay for what they want. And what about it'll create jobs? This is the other one. What about it'll create jobs? Okay. I want nobody in this room ever again to use the phrase create jobs. We do not want to create jobs in this world. We want to create wealth. If you could create wealth without jobs, that would be good. In fact, that would be heaven. Literally, that's what manna from heaven is. Wealth without work. That would be a good thing. You might remember the old story about the economist who was off on a tour of China or whatever, and he saw these guys digging with shovels, and he asked his tour guide, he says, what are they doing? And he said, we're, we're constructing a dam here. And the economist said, why don't you get a steam shovel? And the, the tour guide said, well, that would cost these men their jobs. And the economist said, oh, I thought you wanted a dam. If it's jobs you want, you should give them spoons. We could create 100% employment by drafting the entire country to dig holes and fill them back up again. Everybody would have a job. But you wouldn't have wealth. It's wealth that we want to create. Or, as the great Adam Smith put it, consumption is the sole end and purpose of all production and the interest of the producer ought to be attended to only so far as it may be necessary for promoting that of the consumer. This, in my opinion, is the most important part of the wealth of nations. If I were your teacher, I would tell you, that's basically all you need to know from the wealth of nations. That's the most important part. Think about what that means. The producer, 
the manufacturer, the shopkeeper, the, the middleman, his interests should only be consulted as far as they benefit the average person who's trying to buy the product. If that's the case, then it doesn't matter whether something create jobs or saves jobs or destroys jobs or whatever. What you want is cheap stuff fast. The reason we like Walmart is because if I need a powder blue leisure suit at 2 in the morning, by God, I can get one and it'll be cheap too. Now, in today's legal world, there are, surprisingly enough, a lot of provisions of state constitutions that prohibit corporate welfare. I don't have time to go over all of them, so I've just listed a few of them handily here. There's the special law clause, the uh, clauses that provide strong protection against the use of eminent domain, the gift clause, the uniformity clause, provisions of state constitutions that forbid excessive debt, rules that prohibit monopoly. The monopoly man is there, but I just, what I, what I mean by anti-monopoly is rules that prohibit government-controlled coercive monopolies from being established. I would argue to some extent that the entire history of freedom is the war against corporate welfare. Here we have a good example. This is an engraving of the Boston Tea Party. The Boston Tea Party of 1773 was a case in which, the, remember the colonists dressed up in disguises and went on board the ships in Boston Harbor and tossed the tea overboard. What were they protesting? Among other things, they were protesting against British laws, the Tea Act in particular, that made it, uh, uh, gave a monopoly to the East India Company, essentially prohibited the colonists from buying tea from other sellers. Here's a nice little tidbit. This is a passage from Thomas Jefferson's 1774 pamphlet, A Summary View of the Bright Rights of British America. This is what got him the job writing the Declaration of Independence. And in his objections to British rule is this part. He complains about British laws that made it illegal to make things out of iron in the colonies. We could, we could, we could, we could uh, mine the iron and we could make ingots out of it, but then you had to send it off to Britain to be manufactured into consumer goods and brought back to the United States. Why? Say it with me. To create jobs, right? That's what it was for. It was to protect the jobs of the ironmongers in Great Britain, or as Jefferson calls them, not men but machines in the island of Great Britain. So why does corporate welfare happen? Well, there's a number of reasons. The primary reason is what public choice economists call rent seeking. I hope you all are familiar with the theory of public choice and the concept of rent seeking. It is the most important thing you can, well, the second most important thing you can know about government. I'll get to the most important thing later. This is the second most important thing you can know about government. Rent seeking is the phenomenon whereby legislation is worth a lot of money to people. So they're going to invest their time and money to get legislation for them. Okay? It's actually a very simple concept. Economists have to use technical terms to confuse everybody. They call it rent seeking. We call it lobbying. Very simple. Let's say I'm the government, and just to make things easy here for, in math terms, let's assume, there's, let's assume there's 99 people in this room, and I'm the government, and I'm going to tax you all $1. How much money do I have in my hand? $99. Now I'm going to give the, this jackpot here, I'm going to give it to one of these three people in this row right here. How much that what they're going to do to persuade me, they're going to take me out to lunch. And at lunch, they're going to say, here's why you should give me the $99, right? And they're going to do it over successive days. So how much are they going to spend on my lunch? <whistles> Not quite. 33. It's simple uh, gambling odds, right? It's a, it's a jackpot times your chances of winning. So it's $99 times one third chance of winning. You're gonna, they're gonna each spend $33 on my lunch, right? How much are you gonna spend to persuade me not to take the dollar from you? 99 cents, right? You're not gonna spend $5 trying to persuade me not to take a dollar from you because then you'd lose out, right? So I, the government, actually think the that the people want my fantastic new wealth redistribution program. Because these lobbyists keep taking me to $33 lunches. And you know, every now and then there's a dollar's worth of complaint from all you Tea Party people out there. But you know, you're going to forget by the time tax time rolls around. 
There's a reason tax time's in April and, and the elections are in November, right? As far as you can possibly get without coming around the other way. So James Buchanan and Gordon Tullock, who basically invented this theory, put, in the, put it very well in their book, The Calculus of Consent. The profitability of investment in political activity is a direct function of the size of the total public sector, that is the, the size of the total amount of money that the government is redistributing, and an inverse function of the generality of the budget. In other words, it's decreased by how general the benefits are. If everybody's getting the same dollar that got taken from them, there's not gonna be a lot of lobbying. But if I'm gonna take a dollar from each of you and only these three people are eligible for the winnings, well then there's gonna be a lot of lobbying from them. So that's what rent seeking, that's what public choice is, that's why corporate welfare happens. Costco has whole departments of people whose only job it is to go to city council meetings to persuade them to tear down your house and give the land to Costco. I pick on Costco because they're the nation's leading abuser of eminent domain. If you want to know how they bring you such low, low prices, it's because they don't pay for their real estate. So they have people whose job that is. How about you? How many of you have even been to a city council meeting? Right, and you're nerds. So you can imagine what the average population is like, right? Now the story of corporate welfare in the United States is long and complicated, but it follows a pretty easy pattern. What happens is somebody has a brilliant idea, or what seems like a brilliant idea. People vote for them, and either it fails or maybe it works, but then the next one doesn't succeed. And then eventually people end up poor, and then they swear they'll never do it again, and they re revise their state constitutions and say, we'll never do that again, and then a few generations go by and people forget, and then they decide to try it again, and the cycle continues. Probably the earliest example of corporate welfare begins at the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal was a government-run project to build a canal between Albany and Buffalo, and it was a tremendous success. It was a, it was a huge success. It was a great idea. A libertarian friend of mine likes to say, the government is so bad it can't even get everything wrong. Right? Uh, it got this one right. It was the brainchild of New York Governor DeWitt Clinton and it was the making of New York. But that also meant that a lot of other people thought, well, why don't we try it? And they weren't so successful. In the early 19th century, there was an explosion of interest in these internal improvements, canals, railroads, and so forth. In 1837, the state of Illinois passed the Internal Improvement Act, which devoted $10 million of taxpayer money. And that was back when $10 million was a lot of money. To the construction of railroad, that was a joke. $10 million is supposed to still be a lot of money. Anyway, uh, to the construction of railroads and other internal improvements, but the money vanished and the projects weren't built. And then a nationwide depression hit, largely due to states doing this sort of thing. But rather than back out, the state of Illinois spent even more money on the plan. They said, well, what's gone wrong here is they didn't get enough funding. So they threw enough, more taxpayers' dollars at it, and those disappeared too. And in the years that follow, Illinois, as well as Arkansas, Indiana, Louisiana, Maryland, Michigan, Mississippi, Pennsylvania, and Florida all went bankrupt. So... Illinois convened another constitutional convention, and in 1848, it adopted a new constitution that included a total prohibition on these sorts of internal improvement projects. It declared the state would not engage in internal improvements, but would allow private companies to do that instead. Rather than undertaking its own projects, corporations could be formed under general laws, and they could build railroads and so forth, instead of the government doing it or outsourcing it to one particular privately a, pri uh, um, a favorite of the government, some, some crony friend of the governor or something. Now much has changed since then, but under the Illinois' current constitution, which was written in 1970, this provision still survives in a modified form in a provision that makes it against the constitution to make an irrevocable grant of special privileges or immunities. This is what we call a special law clause. Special law clauses are intended to prohibit the government from passing laws that single out one particular group of beneficiaries for special benefits or a particular group for special burdens, right? The law that says these three people get the, get the special cash, right? A law that says Tim Sandifer shall do X is a special law, as opposed to a general law, which is a law that says, you know, all people who drive cars shall do X or all people who practice law shall do X or what have you. Special laws are often used to allow for corporate welfare because they single out a t or target a particular group or individual 
for corporate welfare because the government can target them specially. The idea behind special law clauses is to require the government to legislate generally rather than on a case-by-case basis. But, of course, it is always easy to design a law that sounds general but still targets a particular person. So courts have to sometimes decide whether a law is too narrowly drawn or not. In most states, they use this thing called the rational basis test. Rational basis test means government wins, period. I mean, that's, that really is what it means. Arizona actually has a rather strong rule against special laws. It allows the government to target laws at particular groups, but the groups have to be defined in such a way that, the people, that people can enter or exit the group. So if that's not the case, then the law is an unconstitutional special law. What I mean by that is imagine that the government passes a law that gives Costco a special privilege. That violates the special law clause because it's not possible for anyone else to become Costco, right? I can't become Costco, you can't become Costco. On the other hand, a law that gives a special privilege to all club stores would probably be constitutional since it's possible for you to start a new club store and existing club stores could go out of business. So you can both enter and exit that class. That means it's not a special law. A third example, a law that applies to club stores with a name that begins the C that are located on Main Street between 1st and 2nd Avenues, that would probably be illegal because it's very unlikely that anybody could enter that class. You could become a club store with stars of the C located in that spot. That's probably just an attempt to pass a special law illegally, but it's hard to tell. Here's an example of an actual special law that we at the Goldwater Institute challenged in court a few years ago. It involved a school district that raised a bunch of money with a bond to build something, and after they were done, they had a bunch of the money left over, and the law requires them to return the money to the taxpayers if that happened, but of course they didn't want to do that. So the legislature passed a special law to keep the, let them keep it, and here's how it read. When nine years or more have passed since an election that authorized a school district to issue bonds, the school district may choose to use the proceeds of any bonds authorized at that election for any necessary capital improvements, provided that the school district's governing board votes to authorize the proposed use of the bond proceeds prior to Ju June 30th, 2013. Unsurprisingly, there was only one school that qualified some states, however, have undermined their special law clauses by interpreting them as loosely as I mentioned before. In Illinois, they use the rational basis test, which, as I said, means the government always wins. If the legislature passes a special law, that's okay, as long as a special law is rationally related to a legitimate government interest. Now, what is a legitimate government interest? Anyone? Anything. That's the right answer. The Supreme Court of the United States in 1987 200 years after the ratification of the Constitution, said in Nolan versus California Coastal Commission, our cases have not laid out the standards for determining what is a legitimate government interest. That's a really shocking statement if you think about it. We don't know what government exists to do. Now, if you don't know what a legitimate government interest is, how do you know whether something's rationally related to it? It's like having a map for the wrong state. Well, it's a great map but it's, I don't know where I'm going, right? It, that's what that kind of logic is. But that's the rule in Illinois. Another very common source of um, corporate welfare is eminent domain. I've mentioned that already. That's the government's power to s force people to sell their private property even if they don't want to. It's part of every state constitution in one way or another, as well as the federal constitution. But all of these constitutions say that the government may only take private property through eminent domain for public use. They cannot take private property for a private use. Now, the reason for this provision was to prohibit the government from taking property from one person and giving it to another. But, of course, that very often happens today thanks to court decisions that have watered down the public use requirement in ways that let the government do basically whatever it feels like. And politically powerful uh, businesses very often use eminent domain to benefit themselves. I bet a few of you can think of one. A good example of that would be Donald Trump. In the 1990s, he tried to use eminent domain to take away the home. I am not making this up. To take away the home of an elderly widow named Vera Koking in order to build a special parking lot for limousines at his Atlantic City casino. He has said in interviews that he thinks it is wonderful to use eminent domain to take away people's land and give it to powerful businesses for their own private profit. 
That's typically the way it works today. Government redevelopment agencies decide that they want a new shopping mall downtown. So they use the power remnant domain to take away the land from the people who own it and give it to private developers instead. The developers use it for their own private profit. They're happy. The politicians look like visionaries because they can do the ribbon cutting ceremony down at the local sh at the brand new shopping mall. And they, everybody, created jobs. Meanwhile, the property owner who lost his home or his small business is shuffled off to somewhere else. Courts today typically allow this because they say having a shopping mall is good for the public and anything a politician thought was good for the public is a public use under the Constitution. As is often the case, the story here begins with railroads in the 19th century. When trains were first invented, they pose a real problem for us lawyers. Weren't they just a new high-tech kind of highway or road? And the government had always used eminent domain to build roads, right? So couldn't it also use it to build a railroad? The problem is that a road is a public use because the public can use it. But a railroad is a private business. It charges money for tickets. So the compromise that judges reached was to say that railroads could use eminent domain, although they're privately owned, because they're regulated by the government. They're not allowed to refuse customers, for instance, and the prices that they charge for tickets are limited by government. So they're public utilities. And even that wasn't really a satisfactory answer, because what about private rail spurs that only serve one specific mine or one specific lumber yard? Over the course of the 19th century, courts backed away from enforcing the public use clause, and they started saying that if the legislature wanted to do it, that was enough. That, of course, led to a lot of abuses. Railroads are benefiting financially from taking away other people's land, so the people held a constitutional convention and tried to revise their constitutions to prevent these kinds of abuses, right? Consider the Missouri Constitution. Missouri's first constitution was 1820, right? You all remember that? Missouri Compromise, right? 1820. And it sounds very much like the federal constitution. Property can be taken only for public use. And then come the railroads. And in, 19, in 1875, after decades of experience at the railroads, the state issues a new constitution that is much more elaborate. In fact, it contained two separate paragraphs about eminent domain. The first prohibits private property from being taken for private use even with compensation. And if the legislature says something's a public use, that's not good enough. That is very strong language. In 1906, the Missouri Supreme Court even issued a powerful opinion that explains why this provision is in there. Quote, suppose an influential individual to whom a slice of his neighbor's property would be very convenient should ask the city council to condemn that property for his use. And the council should pass an ordinance, as requested, declaring that it condemned the property for the use of that individual. Well, of course, that would be void on its face. But suppose the council intending the condemnation to really be for the sole benefit of that individual, in order to give it validity, should say in the ordinance that the property was condemned for a public street. Would that false recital in the ordinance be conclusive? Would it put the man whose property was taken and the people in the district who were to be taxed for it beyond the protection of the constitutional guarantee? And when the city comes to ask the aid of a court to carry that ordinance into effect, is it possible that the court must be a mere tool to do the will of the council with no power to inquire into the truth of the matter? What protection has a citizen for his constitutional rights if the courts cannot look through a sham and see the truth? And how can the courts learn the truth if they must take the recitals in the ordinance as conclusive? and reject all evidence to show their untruth, end quote. Love that passage because that is now the law in the United States. Why? Because of progressivism. At the very time that the court was saying that, 1906, during the late, early, late 19th, early 20th century, widespread political movements began in the United States to change how the Constitution was interpreted. And this movement was called progressivism. Among its many tenets was increasing the authority of the government to control the economy and the use of private property. Constitutional rules that protected property rights and economic freedom were reduced, and bureaucratic agencies were created and given great authority over aspects of the economy. In the 1930s, it was these ideas that would lead to the creation of the rational basis test that I've mentioned. But as early as 1913, courts were already expanding eminent domain. In 1913, the California Supreme Court ruled that anything calculated to promote the education, recreation, or pleasure of the public 
would satisfy the public use requirement. Anybody know the Egan case, by the way? Know what the property was that was at issue in Egan? It's PCH, first, the first recreational highway constructed in the United States. That's pretty broad power there to say that even the recreation and pleasure of the public is enough to steal somebody's private property. Even in Missouri, which had had such strong protections against the abuse of power, courts did the same thing. In 1923, the Missouri Supreme Court said recent developments in civilization required a more liberal application of the term public use, despite the fact that the constitution of the state had not changed. What that meant was that government was given greater power to take property from the people that the government disapproved of and give it to people that the government liked better. This began with concerns about slums. If, you've, if you're familiar with the use of eminent domain, you know that it's often said that eminent domain is used to eliminate blight. That term blight was first used in this 1925 Ohio court decision that said the government could use eminent domain to demolish slums. Basic idea is very simple. If you kick all the poor people out of your city, you won't have any more poor people in your city. <laughs> so, who were the people most commonly victimized by the use of eminent domain? Poor people, members of raci racial minorities who didn't have the political influence necessary to get the government to respect their property rights. Now, I've been beating up on Missouri. I love to beat up on Missouri. So I want to add that actually that state ended up taking a somewhat more honest path than other states have. In 1944, it held another constitutional convention and wrote a new constitution where it added a new provision to the state constitution expressly allowing it to use eminent domain to eliminate blighted areas and to allow the use of eminent domain for recreational and other facilities. Again, that's very broad. Think about it. The state can take away your home and your business away to another private owner in order to provide recreational facilities or to eliminate substandard areas. What is substandard? Maybe. Whatever the government says it is. In California, the term blight is defined in a statute. It's got two, it's got two lists of criteria and you need one from one and one from the other and then the property is blighted. My favorite one on there is lack of parking. Um, or uh, substandard areas. What is substandard? It's substandard. Or um, uh, factors that significantly hinder the economically viable use of buildings. What does that mean? Whatever the government says it means, right? A factor that substantially hinders the economically viable use of the building. Isn't the building's very existence one of those factors? Now, Missouri defines the term so broadly that 15 years ago it declared the Chesterfield Mall in St. Louis blighted, despite the fact that it does $100 million in business every year. A court upheld that decision on the grounds that the mall has irregularly platted lots that constrain its ability to expand. So that's what blight means today. We're not talking about slum clearance anymore. Of course, in 2005, the Supreme Court upheld the expansive use of eminent domain for private development in Kelo versus New London on the grounds that promoting economic development is a traditional and long accepted function of government. In her dissenting opinion, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor objected that under that theory, everybody's property is basically for sale all the time. Nothing is to prevent the state from replacing any Motel 6 with a Ritz-Carlton, any home with a shopping mall, or any farm with a factory. And she's right. If the public use clause of the Constitution means anything politicians think will benefit the public, then it means nothing. By the way, you might recall that after the Kelo decision, some states passed laws to restrict the use of eminent domain. Maybe you don't recall that. You all probably were born after the Kelo decision was decided, right? Anyway, uh, after, I mean, after Kelo was announced, a lot of states passed these state laws that are supposed to restrict the use of eminent domain and protect private property rights. Well, California has the distinction of being the only state to increase its power of eminent domain after Kelo by ballot initiative. It passed Prop 99, which prohibits the use of eminent domain against owner-occupied homes. Owner-occupied homes, which are hardly ever taken through eminent domain anyway. Eminent domain is usually used in business areas because you're building businesses. So that doesn't really matter. And only owner-occupied homes. So apartment, uh, people live in apartments. Oh, well, sucks to be them, I guess, right? Most of the time, eminent domain, uh, these protections won't even apply. And even when these due protections do apply, they still don't apply if it's a, um, a, one of the specified uses I have underlined here. So private use is incidental to a library or incidental to a communication-related infrastructure or recreational purposes. 
So if they condemn a house through eminent domain to build a shopping mall and then put a police station or a library in the shopping mall, there you go. Actually, my new home state of Arizona, y'all are welcome to come visit anytime. We passed the, really the only strong protection against eminent domain abuse, that was Prop 207. It says no eminent domain for private development, and it specifically says economic development is not an acceptable purpose for the use of eminent domain. While we're talking about Arizona, I want to talk br briefly about some other constitutional clauses that prohibit corporate welfare that are a centerpiece of our project at the Goldwater Institute, but are also found in the constitutions of virtually all of the states, even though, as I said, most of the time they're overlooked, they're ignored, lawyers don't think to use them in court, and a lot of the time the courts will ignore them themselves. These are the, now the provisions I'm going to talk about are the gift clause and the uniformity clause. The gift clause forbids the government from giving money to corporations or buying stock in corporations, with few exceptions. I mean it. That's pretty strong stuff right there. Government may not make any donation or grant by subsidy or otherwise to any individual association or corporation. And Arizona guards have done a pretty decent job of enforcing this clause. They've held that the government can buy things, of course, and it can give money to private companies, but it has to be in exchange for something and it has to be for a public purpose. And it can't be di grossly disproportionate to what the government, for what the public gets in exchange, right? So the government can't like hire a consultant to write a report and then give him a Ferrari in exchange for one hour's work, right? That would be grossly disproportionately disproportionate. That would just be a fake. That would be a way of giving him the Ferrari as a gift. Right now, my colleague Jim Manley is litigating a case in Tucson where the county has decided to sponsor a new business to boost tourism in Pima County. This business is called Worldview, and the idea is that they'll take passengers up in specially modified high-altitude balloons. They'll have comfortable places to sit and stuff to eat and drink, and you can take it up into the stratosphere. Now, Worldview has never actually taken anybody up in one of their balloons, and they don't have an FAA permit to do so, but they swear they'll do it. Tickets are $75,000 per ride in a county where that's more than twice the annual average income. But what the county, what the county has done is they've taken government-owned property and used it as collateral to finance a $15 million uh, loan to build Worldview a 135,000 square foot headquarters and a launch pad for their balloon. Worldview doesn't have to pay for this use. It only has to pay to maintain the launch pad, pays below market rates, rent for the other property. And if the company fails or it moves away, it or it doesn't hire the people that it claims will hire, creating jobs, taxpayers are stuck. They can cancel the contract, but then they have a launch pad and it's a little hard to sell those on eBay. This is obviously a hugely risky idea. Why didn't a private bank lend the money to Worldview to build this Worldview Launchpad? Why? Anybody? They saw how risky it was, right? The chances of getting your money back are too small for the bank to risk the money. So why not have the taxpayer pay the risk? Because the taxpayer has no choice in the matter, right? government doesn't care because it's not its money. The risk is borne by the taxpayers. This is a classic case of corporate welfare. So we sued, and a couple weeks ago the court ruled in our favor and declared that the county violated competitive building laws when it leased the property to Worldview at below market rates. It'll be going up to the Court of Appeals soon. We fondly refer to this as the balloon doggle. Then there's the uniformity clause. This is a constitutional provision that forbids the government from imposing special tax rules on one particular group of people versus another. So in Arizona's constitution, it says all taxes shall be uniform upon the same class of property. What does that mean? It means the government can't impose a tax on these people, but not on those people. Basically the same as the special law clause that I mentioned before. Now, it can be a little tricky because it does make sense to tax different things differently, right? We tax residences different from business property. That makes sense. So it can be hard to draw the line sometimes. But there's an egregious abuse of the uniformity clause that does happen in Arizona. And it's actually pretty unique to Arizona. But California does have something somewhat similar called tax increment financing. 
What Arizona does is called Jeeplet Abatement. Jeeplet. Stands for Government Property Lease Excise Tax. The trick works this way. The developer transfers his land to the government's ownership. The government then leases the property back at bargain basement rates to the developer. But because it's government property now, there's no property tax. And although the developer is supposed to pay a different kind of tax, that's usually waived. So the developer basically gets a huge tax break, which means that the taxes have to be made up by the neighboring property owners. They all get a proportionate increase in order to make up the difference. Right now, we at the Goldwater Institute are challenging Jeeplet in a lawsuit that we filed just days ago that challenges development on, uh, to build a 19 story high rise in, uh, on Roosevelt Row, Roosevelt Row in Phoenix. Now this is a 19 story building. They'll build it with eight years of no taxes, 17 years of greatly reduced taxes for a total subsidy of $8 million that the neighboring properties will have to, have to bear because of course the neighboring property owners don't have the political influence to get a special handout, right? As my colleague Jim Manley puts it, if Arizona cities think property tax rates are too high, they should lower tax rates for everyone, not use Jeeplet to let politically connected few avoid paying any property taxes at all while everyone else shoulders the burden. What does it mean to be against corporate welfare? I think it's important to be clear on this point. When we at the Goldwater Institute say that we're opposed to corporate welfare, we don't mean that we're anti-development or that we're anti-business. Of course not. Instead, it means that the rules should be the same for everyone and success should come as a result of merit instead of favoritism by those in power. But it seems that people are often under the impression that if you're opposed to corporate welfare, you're either opposed to business generally or more shockingly, they think that being against corporate welfare mean, means that you think government should have more power that there should be more stringent regulation of the economy, and that legislators and bureaucrats should have greater authority to rein in the corporations. This gets it entirely backward. Corporate welfare is the result of a business industry alliance of businesses using the government to get what they want and vice versa. Vice versa. Big business loves big government. They've dealt with big government for so long that they know exactly how to operate the system. They're skilled hands at lobbying, they know all the congressmen and all the bureaucrats. They have tremendous political advantages that you and I don't have. And of course, big government loves big business too, since it loves the taxes and the politicians love to say they're creating jobs. That gets us back to the idea that I started with, rent seeking. If the government has more power, that means its power becomes worth more money. And that means that businesses are going to invest more time and more money into gaining that power. And you and I don't have that kind of time and money. In a political contest, there's no way that I'm going to beat Costco or Home Depot or Target. The solution is not more government, it is less government. The last thing big, big business wants is economic competition and economic freedom because that means they would have to com concentrate on winning, on, uh, winning com economically, commercially, instead of politically. There are two ways of, of organizing the world, basically. There's the economic way and there's the political way. In the economic way, you make money by satisfying consumers and working hard, lowering prices, innovating, improving the quality of your product, and so forth. In the political way, you succeed by satisfying politicians, by making a loud noise at the city council meeting, by doing favors for politicians, getting favors from them, stifling innovation, taking away consumers' choices. In the economic way, you profit by making choices carefully. In the political way, well, the most important thing that you can know about government is it gets paid even if it gets the answer wrong. It gets paid even if it gets the answer wrong. If the restaurant gets my order wrong or it charges too much or it makes bad food, I don't go there anymore. They don't get my money. If they poison me, they can go out of business, go to jail. If the government delivers my mail late or makes me stand in line at the DMV or charges me too much and gives me bad service, or makes me go out of security and back through security at San Diego airport when changing planes, well, it gets paid anyway. It never goes out of business. Bureaucrats almost never go to jail. 
In fact, if they do a bad job, they often get more money because they can go to the co Congress or the city council or whatever it might be and say, well, the reason we did a bad job is because our funding was so low, you need to increase our budget next year, right? I want to emphasize this point because many of you out there distrust corporations and you think big business is evil. Well, all power to you. Absolutely. My whole point today, the entire point of my presentation, is that business often does immoral and illegal, illegal things. But you should distrust government even more. If a business treats you badly, you can shop somewhere else. If you can refuse to pay them, you can sue them. If a business breaks the law, people go to jail. If government treats you badly, you can't shop somewhere else. You can't refuse to pay. And you usually can't sue them, unless you have a great lawyer like me. Now, I know what you think. You, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, we can vote. Oh, you naive, naive children. <laughs> the vast majority of the laws under which you live your life are not even written by elected officials and are not ever voted on by any legislature. How many laws did Congress pass in 2016? <laughs> too many. How much is too many? How many laws did Congress pass last year? Thousands? 600? About 90. How many regulations were passed by the federal regulatory administrative agencies? Hundreds of thousands, right? And that's just the federal government. You add the states in there, and these rules are not passed by elected officials. You don't elect the people who run the Department of Housing and Urban Development, the the Department of Commerce. You don't hire, you don't, you don't elect those people. You can't throw them out of office. They're hired bureaucrats who often can't even be fired because they're members of government unions, right? So if, if you think, well, we can vote the bums out, the bums didn't write the law. In fact, most of the time, here's how it works. Idealistic politician runs for office on the no bad things platform. That's me. I'm congressman, I'm gonna be your congressman. I'm running for office, my name's Tim, I'm running for office, I'd like you to vote for me. I'm against bad things. If you're against bad things, I hope you'll vote for me in November, right? And so you do, because you're against bad things, right? Everybody here's against bad things, right? Right? Well, Debbie's not, but everybody else, you're all against bad things, right? So you all vote for me, so I get elected on the no bad things. First day in office, I'm gonna keep my campaign pledge to my voters, my constituents. I write up a new law. Here it is right here. Then, oh no, that's too long. It's one page, one page law. It says right here, there shall be no more bad things. Part two, there shall now be a federal no bad things agency which shall define what a bad thing is, investigate possible bad things, and punish the bad things. And everybody votes for it because they're against bad things. And then what do I do? I go home to my constituents. I say, I kept my promise to you. I kept my pledge, my, my, my fellow citizens. I was against bad things, and bad things are now against the law. I put an end to bad things. And then I move on to other issues, you know, uh, not so good things, right? Meanwhile, the bad things agency starts getting to work, and they start, well, what well, is a bad thing? I don't know, well, anything that is bad, you know? They start writing these vague, ambiguous rules. They start investigating people. They're like, well, well, Professor Ortega, I think you did a bad thing, and you have to go to an administrative agency hearing where the rules of due process do not even apply in administrative hearings. Hearsay is admissible. You're not necessarily entitled to have a lawyer, et cetera, et cetera. And then we'll, we, the bad things agency, will decide whether you did a bad thing. Right? Because there's no judge. The, the administrative agency is the hearing is presided over by a person from the administrative agency. So the prosecutor is paying the judge. Do you think she's going to win? No. That's how the law is made in this country. Almost all of the laws you think that you are governed by are written by hired bureaucrats and administrative agencies who are not politically accountable. And no matter how liberal you might be, that should worry you. That is as undemocratic as it gets. And I'm not talking about just big things. I'm talking about every little thing. The federal government sets the rules for everything on, from how thick ketchup can be in a fast food packet to the angle at which your office chair can recline. And those rules are not written by elected officials. So if you think that you, your vote counts, makes a difference to how the government operates, it virtually never does. I, have a, I had a friend who believed very strongly in voting, and this really bothered him when I would say this. Uh, voting is basically like, like a religious ceremony. It's a way of 
showing that you have faith in democracy. It doesn't actually change the outcome of God's will, or in this case, the, how the government works. It really bothered him that I would say that. He would say, but remember, Bush versus Gore came down to a handful of votes. There were these historical cases. Andrew Johnson's impeachment came down to one vote, et cetera, et cetera. Imagine a man who is absolutely convinced that lightning is going to strike him when he goes out to get his mail. Absolutely will not go get his mail. He's certain that as soon as he steps outside the door, he'll get struck by lightning. So he's not going to go get his mail. And you, you, his friend, you're patient with the guy. You're like, look, talk with me here. This is a concern. This is a psychological syndrome. Let me talk with you. you know, you're patient with you. You're, you're talking through. Finally, after months of this, he gets up the guts to go outside and get his mail. He opens the door, he takes a step outside, and bam, he gets struck by lightning. Was he right? No! Of course he wasn't right. It is irrational to think you're going to get struck by lightning when you go to get your mail. Even if he happened by freak of happenstance to be right that one time, right? So, yeah, okay, all of you idealists and people who believe that voting is going to change the world. You can point out to me the freakish one time when everything mattered, depending on one vote. It doesn't change the fact that every day of your life, federal and state administrative agencies are passing thousands of regulations that govern your life, controlling how you live your life without any meaningful democratic oversight. If you distrust the businesses, you should distrust the government even more. What is the solution to corporate welfare? It's not more government. It's not regulating elections to make sure that people don't spend money on campaign advertisements and all that kind of nonsense. There's only one way to get money out of politics, and that's to get politics out of money. Limit government by prohibiting it from giving favors to some people and imposing burdens on other people. A free market is one in which you cannot use force to get your way. You can succeed by hard work, innovation, serving the customer. Our vision is that economic success should come through satisfying the consumer, not from political favoritism and wealth redistribution. That is the only true solution to the problem of corporate welfare. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. The microphone around to you. It's very hard for me to see because of the lights, too, so bear with me. I think there was somebody down here. Yes, yes. So I just wanted to ask, uh, what's, your, uh, what's your thoughts on RFP processes currently and uh, whether or not they can, be, uh, they can be changed and modified to, to more appropriately uh, uh, address some of these concerns? You're talking about uh, public contracting and requests for proposals from the, from the public? Even as something as simple as, uh, as providing supplies uh, is something that, um, that someone had to figure out a process somewhere in that administrative right. structure that you're talking about. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, uh, even ordering a stapler requires a, you know, a supplier and it requires uh, some kind of contract to provide it. Um, on my previous campus, we had uh, food services that had to be provided. It was, it was mostly to do with the liability concerns. It was uh, someone gets sick, it's not the school's responsibility, right. it's, the, it's the contracting company that provided the food and therefore they have the liability that they have to cover um, and meet all the food, uh, uh, the food requirements. I don't <laughs> think I really have a clear answer for that question. I, I would say the reason why we have this, the competitive bidding rules that we do is because during the progressive era, there was a lot of concern about this favoritism that was going on, about cronies and special friends of the governor getting special handouts. In fact, there's a, an amusing chapter on this in Mark Twain's book, Roughing It, where he talks about the, the territorial legislature in Nevada handing out charters for private toll roads. And, you know, people would just, if, you're, if you know the governor, you can get a charter for private toll road, right? And so the idea behind these reforms is to try and rationalize the process and try and make it so that it, was, it, it would be less likely to fall into uh, the hands of favoritism. Obviously, I'm in favor of that. Incidentally, I think some of my libertarian friends are a little bit naive on this issue. A lot of my, uh, some of my libertarian friends very quickly cite to the idea of privatization and outsourcing. Well, why don't, we should have the government just hire a private contractor to do such and such a thing rather than having the government do it. And there are advantages to that. The disadvantage, the reason why that isn't the way we do it, is because of these concerns. So why does Caltrans build roads? 
Because back in the olden days, the government would just hire a private crony to build the roads, and the private crony would be a friend of the governor and would get favoritism politically and that sort of thing. So I think the competitive bidding system is a good idea in practice. As, I mean, in theory, how it could be improved in practice, I don't really have any answers to that. Okay, we have one question back here. Way in the back. Yep. Yeah. Uh, my question would be that, so when you think that getting uh, money, comp politics completely out of money, you would just do it like with completely out of lo lobbying, like no more lobbying, having like all politicians maybe have the same kind of like money to do campaigns and that kind of stuff? Um, no, definitely not. Uh, I'm very much opposed to rules that restrict political campaigning, political speech, um, the campaign finance regulations. There's a lot of problems with them. Let me give you just one of the problems. Well, aside from the fact that the First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law that restricts the freedom of speech. No law. It doesn't say some laws. It doesn't say laws that we think are important. It doesn't say Congress can pass laws to control the democratic process as long as we think that they're essentially pro-democracy. It doesn't say that. It says Congress shall pass no law restricting the freedom of speech. And these restrictions on campaign donations, campaign financing, the kinds of commercials that you can air and when, plainly violate that and all of them should be struck off the books immediately for that reason alone. But if we're going to talk about the practicalities, Campaign finance regulations are pro-incumbent. They help the incumbent tremendously. Let's say that I were going to run for Senate in Arizona challenging Senator John McCain. There are some worlds in which I would try something like that. So Senator McCain and I are running for Senate. Senator McCain can make the Sunday talk shows anytime he wants. Calls up ABC, he calls up NBC, he calls up CBS, calls up CNN. He says, hey, I'd like to come on your show, Senator. They say, yes, sir, Mr. Senator, sir. They put him on there, and he's on back-to-back -back nationwide every single show with his name and the word Senator in front of it. Senator John McCain. I'm Tim. <laughs> I'm going to knock on doors and shake hands with people and say, I'd like you to vote for me. And I'm going to go to the next, I'm going to shake hands and say, I'd like you to vote for me. Right? That's what, that's what I'm supposed to do? No. If I'm going to run against Senator John McCain, I'm going to need a lot of television advertising. I'm going to need as much money as I can possibly get. Now, maybe you think that's a bad thing. Maybe you think that if I take a bunch of money from the Spoon Collectors Guild, that I'm going to get elected and pass a, law, a bunch of laws favorable to the Spoon Collectors Guild. Well, there's a couple things you can do about that. One, vote against me. Two, oppose the kind of world in which I can pass laws favorable to the Spoon Collectors Guild. Three, you can publicize the world. You know Sandifer takes a bunch of money from the Spoon Collectors Guild. Did you know Sandifer? We pass out pamphlets. Say, oh, they, they, look, read this pamphlet. It talks about all the connections between Sandifer and the Spoon Collectors Guild, right? The cure for speech is more speech. If you think somebody's telling a lie, tell the truth. That's the only acceptable solution. I am very much opposed to campaign finance regulations and other restrictions on free speech for this reason. I'll give you another example that we actually did at the Goldwater Institute a while back. In Kentucky, it was legal for labor unions to donate tens of thousands of dollars to political campaigns and illegal for corporations to donate practically anything to a campaign. Think that's fair? Maybe some people do. If you think that the unions represent the true voice of the working man and you think corporations are, the, are the, the gears by which capitalism grinds the bones of the poor, you might think that's a good idea. I, for one, think that, cap that corporations and unions and everybody should have the same right to speak their mind, advocate for candidates and for issues as anybody else. And if it costs money to buy an ad on, an, on a television set, good. Good for you, right? Government shouldn't be in, their, in that business. Besides which, it won't ever work. It will never work. Have you noticed how year after year there's more and more regulations of campaign finance? There's another law, and then another law, and then another law, and another law. Why is that? Every year, evil, greedy corporations found a loophole in the law. Yeah, that's what they do. They hire lawyers, not good lawyers like me, but evil lawyers, <laughs> whose job it is to find loopholes in the law. Can you blame them? In fact, corporate directors owe it to their owe an, a moral obligation to their investors to do so. What's the job of a corporate uh, of a corporate board member? You know, it's a fiduciary duty to uh, maximize the profits of the corporation and do the best interests of the corporation. So he's going to do that. He has to, and good for him, 
right? You're never going to close all the loopholes. Every time you close a loophole, you just create two new loopholes, right? One on either side. So it's never going to work. The only solution to the problem is one people don't want to hear. They don't want to hear it. No, oh, I like wealth redistribution. No, <laughs> because someday the lottery will favor me. Someday the government will give me a bunch of my neighbor's money. So I don't want to hear it. But the only answer is get government out of the wealth redistribution business. It's the only solution. Next question. Yes, sir. The US Constitution uh, authorizes uh, Congress to uh, legislate for the general welfare. That's right. And the Constitution says the federal government may only have enumerated powers. Right. Therefore, does that imply that legislation for specific welfare of specific groups is unconstitutional. You are an old-fashioned man, sir. <laughs> uh, yes, in my opinion, that is exactly what it says. The Constitution says that Congress can legislate for the general welfare as opposed to the specific welfare, right? Here's a handy tidbit. If you're ever reading the Constitution, you're like, what does this clause do? It has to prohibit something. There has to be something that would not be allowed under that clause, okay? So you get out your constitutions. I'm sure you all have your copy of the constitution with you. But if you don't, you can use your handy constitution iPhone app. <laughs> Mine got updated the other day and I don't know why. <laughs> anyway, uh, if you look up the constitution, you'll, look, you'll find something in there like that. You'll, well, the Congress can provide for the general welfare. What, well, what does that mean? Well, it means it can't provide for the specific welfare. That's a very old-fashioned concept that the courts have ignored for at least 75 years. And as far as enumerated powers are concerned, well, the courts claim they care about the idea of enumerated powers, but they don't. Everybody, know here what, everybody here knows what enumerated powers means, right? Constitution allows Congress only to do those things that are found written down in the Constitution. That is Article 1, Section 8, and a handful of other places. If you can't find it in there, Congress can't do it, in theory. But as Homer Simpson says, in theory, communism works, Marge, in theory. <laughs> in theory, Cong but of course they get away with it by interpreting the language very broadly. We were talking about this uh, at lunch today, about how the courts interpret these clauses very broadly. Chief Justice Roberts has pioneered a legal theory that I call the, the Julius Caesar theory of constitutional law. It works like this. So imagine a person comes up to you on the street one day and he says to you, I am Julius Caesar. Now you would think to yourself, this man is insane, right? He isn't Julius Caesar. He thinks he's Julius Caesar. He's clearly out of his mind. That's not what Chief Justice Roberts would do. Chief Justice Roberts would say, it would make a lot more sense for him to have said, I admire Julius Caesar. Therefore, that's what he said. Right? That's how the court rules now. Is, uh, the, I admire Julius Caesar. The, Obamacare says that the penalty is a penalty. It calls it a penalty. It's under the section that says penalties. But it's actually a tax because that would make a lot more sense. Bond versus United States. This was a case about the International uh, Anti-Chemical Weapons Treaty. And this is, the, you might remember the fantastic facts of this case. Woman found out her husband, her husband was having an affair with her best friend. So she got a supply of some sort of poison chemical and painted the woman's doorknob with it and her mailbox hoping to kill the woman. The woman touched the doorknob and it burned her hand a little bit, but that was it. She, so the, 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 the malf, malfeasor, the defendant, was charged with a violation of the International Chemical Weapons Treaty. Which does say, in fairness to the prosecutors, does say any substance that is likely to kill or harm any living creature. During the oral argument in the case, Justice Alito said, well, now, if I pour vinegar in a fish tank, it'll kill the fish. Is vinegar a chemical weapon? The answer to that is yes. But, <laughs> no, under the admire Julius Caesar theory. No, no, now the court says that it, it only applies to things that are typically used as weapons. That's not in the treaty, not in the treaty anywhere, but now that's what the law means. Anyway, so the idea of enumerated powers being a restriction on the Constitution was the most important part of the Constitution. That's it. 
Remember, James Madison and the other founders did not want to have a Bill of Rights. Why? Why didn't the founders want to have a Bill of Rights? Limits them. What's that? It's a limit. It's a limit, right? Constitution is a limit, not a grant. It doesn't give you anything. It withholds things from the government. That's what the, the Constitution does. So they said it makes no sense to have a Bill of Rights. And they said, and it's very dangerous. You put a Bill of Rights in there, there's going to be people who say, well, I don't see the right to run barefoot through sprinklers listed here, so you don't have the right to run barefoot through sprinklers on a hot summer day. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. We call those people conservatives. <laughs> conservatives say, well, I don't see a right to privacy in the Constitution, even though all rights are rights to privacy. That's what rights are. Rights say, this is my private business, none of your business, right? We used to call it beeswax. It's the, the none of your beeswax, now call it the right to privacy. <laughs> That's what rights are. Con con conservatives say, I don't see a right to do this, a right to do that in the Constitution, so you don't have that right. The Ninth Amendment says, don't read the Constitution this way, but everybody ignores it, right? So that's why the Founding Fathers didn't want to have a Bill of Rights, because they were afraid that if you listed some things, people would think that you left the other things out on purpose. And they said, that's, not, that's, that's dangerous, and you don't need it anyway, because Congress doesn't have any power to bar you from running through sprinklers on a hot summer day anyway. It's not in Article 1, Section 8. It's not an enumerated power, so they can't do it to you. Nowadays, they very well could. They would say that it interferes with interstate commerce, right? I'm not making that up. That's what they would say. They really would, right? You remember uh, what was the what was the 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 case was the the oh gosh, Let's try and think of a, a really good, oh Lopez I mean, United States versus Lopez. Kid goes to a gu goes to school carrying a gun, gets arrested and charged with the federal gun free school zones act. He looks at his constitution, pulls out his iPhone. Actually, this is before iPhones, but he looks at his constitution. He's like, I don't see gun free schools in there. And so he went to the U.S. Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, yeah, how come the federal government has the power to prohibit guns on school campuses? And I am not making this up. The federal government said, well, you see, in order to run the commerce of tomorrow, the kids of today have to have a good education. And to have a good education, they have to go to schools that don't have guns there. Therefore, the power to regulate commerce allows us to prohibit guns near schools. And the Supreme Court said, no, that's too much. And that was the first time since the New Deal the Supreme Court had ever said that something was too much under the Commerce Clause. Oh my gosh. Right? The, Cong the United States Constitution doesn't allow the Congress to prohibit you from smoking weed. Nothing in the Constitution allows that. Back in the 1920s, in great-great-grandpappy's day, when they decided that liquor was the devil's weed, they decided to outlaw drinking. They didn't say, we have the power under the Commerce Clause to outlaw drinking. No, they passed a constitutional amendment to do that because Congress didn't have that power. Now, fast forward to the Nixon administration and Nixon decides to make war on drugs. He says, oh no, let's not pass an amendment. Let's just interpret the Constitution broadly so that, you know, it's part of commerce. So, Angel Rach, a cancer survivor living in Northern California, she grows marijuana in her own backyard for her own consumption to relieve the pain caused by her marijuana. She can't take it orally, she can't take pain meds orally because she vomits them back up as a result of her chemotherapy treatments. So she smokes the, the weed. She didn't buy the seeds, she, they were given to her by somebody else. She doesn't sell the marijuana to anybody else. There is no commerce involved and nothing crosses state lines. And the United States Supreme Court said it was okay to, to punish her for doing that because it's interstate commerce. Why? Well, because there's a national market for drugs and Congress can stamp out the national market, so therefore it can, well, there's a national market for everything. Under that theory, there really is nothing Congress can't do under that rationale. I've gone on for too long about this because it pisses me off so much, but is there another question? Oh, in the front. Yeah, right here. Hi. Yes. Um, so everything you've been saying completely makes sense to me, just seems That's like That's because common. it's right. Yeah, <laughs> it just seems like sense but to all my friends and colleagues they think I'm an idiot for thinking these kind of things that's not necessarily contradictory <laughs> to, to, to you being right in this case yeah. but go ahead do you think the reason why it's so unpopular among 
like thinking like this is so unpopular on, among people my age is has anything to do with the way public schools are taught or what oh, do you yeah. think is the reason oh yeah definitely i i'm myself a survivor of the california public school system <laughs> Uh, I went to Eisenhower High School in Rialto, California, a national blue ribbon school, um, which, <laughs> no. <laughs> anyway, um, yes, the, the cal the, the, in a democracy, and again, I'm talking to my, my liberal friends, in a democracy, do you really want the state in charge of the minds of our children? Do, does the government school system have any incentive to teach the kids to question authority? I'm not saying that the teachers are bad. I had some fantastic teachers. In fact, I had some teachers who were great with me questioning authority, loved it when I questioned authority, because it meant they didn't have to. Right. Uh, I staged a protest in ninth grade because the principal wouldn't let us uh, have, uh, eat lunch out in the quad. We had to sit at the picnic tables. I led a huge protest. Got me a huge, a tremendous amount of trouble, actually. Almost got me expelled, right? My, teach, my ninth grade teacher loved it because he hated the principal, but, and this was a kind of a way for him to get back at him without actually chatting, right? He loved that sort of thing. But anyway, does the school have an incentive to teach kids to question authority, or does it instead, at the very best, sort of subtly inculcate in kids the idea that government is, knows best, that, you know, you really should go where you're told and do what you're told and say what you're told because, you know, that's what you should do. I'm not saying that, the, that these are brainwashing factories. They are not. Again, with the Simpsons references, remember when Homer comes in and closes down the school, he says, the intergalactic gesture has proclaimed this conformity factory closed. I'm not saying all schools are conformity factories. Of course they're not, right? They produce scary libertarian crackpots like myself. But for the most part, they have no incentive to do so. And I think that alone should make you question what the government is doing in education. Now, the progressive era, when all this began with public education also, the idea was a lot of kids are being raised, they're taught at home, they weren't being taught English, they were being taught the religion of their parents, they weren't being taught science, they were often being left out entirely of the classics and other things like that. What we're going to do is we're going to have common schools where kids are going to be brought in together and taught non-denominational general civic education, right? That sounds great, right? That was about 1900 or so. About 1920, they said, and also they can't learn German. <laughs> right? World War I broke out, and there was a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, uh, of uh, prejudice against the Germans, and it was, well, you also can't learn German. That was Wisconsin. And the Supreme Court of the United States said, no, that's, not a, that's no good. Also, the government passed a law that said you can't homeschool your kids. Just can't do it. The Supreme Court also struck that down, thank goodness. And it said, you know, our government is not a bunch of platonic guardians who are there to shape children into mindless, obedient little servants. My favorite, actually, you know, this country owes a tremendous debt of gratitude to high school students because the high school students have gone to court time and time again for their individual rights. And the great story here is the Pledge of Allegiance cases. In 1940, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld a law that required school children to recite the Pledge of Allegiance in a case called Gobitis versus Minersville School District. The Gobitis case involved some kids who were, I think, 8 and 10 years old who didn't want to pledge allegiance to the flag because they thought it violated their religious beliefs. And back in the 1940s, when you pledged allegiance to the flag, you didn't do it this way. You didn't put your, heart over your, your hand over your heart. You held your hand out toward the flag in what is now called the Nazi salute. The very idea, look this up, the very idea behind the Pledge of Allegiance was to inculcate a sense of selfless obedience to the state. That's what it was created for. These kids objected. They said, we shouldn't be required to, to swear allegiance to the flag. And Justice Felix Frankfurter wrote a Supreme Court decision and said, yep, they can be forced to do that because it is the job of the government to force children to learn to obey the state. Only three years later, the Supreme Court reversed that decision in one of the greatest opinions in the history of the Supreme Court, my, um, uh, West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett. And by 1943, we had had a lot of experience with countries where kids were taught mindless obedience to the state. Have you heard of the folk storm? Remember the folk storm? Anybody? Yeah. One person heard of the folk storm. Right. Look this up. This is a nice German word. Your friend will help you. Anyway, uh, in 1943, the Supreme Court struck down the law and said it is not the job of the government to dictate what is right 
in the role of opinions and so forth. And the opinion was written by Justice Robert Jackson, who went on to prosecute the Nazis at the Nuremberg War Tribunals. And Justice Jackson said that the purpose of the Bill of Rights is to remove some things from the vicissitudes of political controversy so that our rights are not subject to majority vote. That's right. That's what the Constitution is about. It's about protecting our rights against the majority. A lot of people think that the government, that the, the great thing about the Constitution is that it's democratic. That's the opposite of what's great about it. What's great about the Constitution is that it protects us against democracy. The word democracy is not even to be found in the Constitution of the United States. Search it, it's not there. But the Constitution goes on for page after page limiting what the government can do to us. Why? To protect us against democracy. That's what it's about. And one of the main reasons is because of what I've been talking about tonight. The idea of corporate welfare. It's not just handing out money to subsidies. It's about things like official churches, right? That's a form of government subsidy to have the government establish a religion that everybody has to follow, right? It's about creating a society in which political influence is not the determinative factor. If you're like me and you were really unpopular in school, you know, you know what politics is like, right? Politics is junior high school and it never gets better than that. The Constitution is designed to protect us against that so that those of us who don't have the kind of wealth and influence as Costco and these other corporations have will be secure in our life, liberty, and our pursuit of the happiness. Thank you very much for having me, and I look forward to seeing you at Flames.